In every video I've ever done on Silent Hill's mythology, I almost always reference the first two games and none of the others. The only time I think I ever seriously deviated from that norm was when I did a video on the character of God, where I referenced a lot of information from Silent Hill 3. Though there is intriguing mythology in the third game, it is comparatively minimal to the first two. Plus, the mythology that is in the third game mostly builds upon what was already well established in the first game. This is why I've had a hard time doing videos on anything that wasn't from the first two games. But a couple of days ago, I finally found a way to talk almost exclusively about Silent Hill 3, and it has to do with the tarot card puzzle that we come across towards the end of the game. On the surface, the tarot cards in this game do not seem to have a deep purpose. They just seem to be there so that they can complement Silent Hill's overarching mystical themes. Kind of like how the Seal of Metatron doesn't have much to do with the angel of the same name from Jewish tradition. But today, I will argue that there is a deeper meaning to these cards and that meaning can be found in a subject we have referenced many times throughout this series, that being psychoanalysis. The eureka moment I had came to me when I was playing a game called Persona 5. Up until this year, I had never played any of the Persona games. The only thing I knew about the games was that they were, apparently, based on Carl Jung's psychoanalytic concepts. Given that I speak a lot about Carl Jung's psychoanalysis, particularly its relevancy to Silent Hill, people have been keen to recommend these games to me. Immediately upon playing Persona 5, I started noticing the numerous similarities between that game and the Silent Hill series. First of all, both series feature a crossing over between worlds. In both games, there is the conscious real world and the unconscious other world. When the protagonists in both games begin to cross over into the unconscious world, the products of the unconscious mind take on physical form, usually in the form of demonic creatures. Some of the names of the demonic creatures in Persona show up in Silent Hill as well. The demons known as Metatron and Samael in Persona share their names with the seal of Metatron and the mark of Samael in Silent Hill. The demon known as Incubus in Silent Hill is modeled after the pagan deity known as Baphomet, who is also a demon that shows up in Persona. There is a demon known as Incubus in the Persona games, but it doesn't share the appearance of Silent Hill's Incubus. But for this video, the main similarity I wanted to focus on is how both Silent Hill 3 and the Persona games made use of tarot cards. Granted, the Persona games reference tarot cards from beginning to end, whereas Silent Hill 3 only references them once. But like with the previous concepts I mentioned, tarot cards also share a link to Carl Jung's psychoanalytic theory. Having read Carl Jung's commentary on tarot cards, I can firmly say that there is more to their use in Silent Hill 3 than we previously understood. To adequately explain the importance of the tarot cards, I need to elaborate on what is probably the most famous contribution by Jung to the world of psychology, the concept of archetypes, and the concept of the collective unconscious. According to Jung, every human being has two sides to their unconscious mind. There is the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. The personal unconscious is where we store things like memories, things that are personal to each individual. The collective unconscious is kind of like the universal mind in Buddhism. It is this force of nature from which the whole universe sprang. Not only that, it dictated the way the universe functions. In regards to human beings, the collective unconscious dictated our behavior in numerous ways, but I will focus on the two most relevant methods. On the one hand, the collective unconscious gifted human beings with instincts. The common example I use to illustrate this is that of a baby and its mother. A baby is instinctually driven to breastfeed. It didn't learn this. That instinct was present within them somewhere between conception and birth. This instinct is present in the collective human species, gifted by the collective unconscious. 
On the other hand, the collective unconscious contains these things called archetypes, which it also uses to dictate human behavior. Archetypes are universal patterns, patterns that we can find throughout nature. Going back to the mother example, mothers are patterns found throughout nature. They are fundamental to the survival of many species. In Jung's mind, every variation of a mother stems back to that one fundamental archetype, the one that was present at the beginning of time. Aside from the mother though, there are numerous variations of archetypes that show up in reality and fiction. There's the archetype of the wise old man, best personified in fictional characters like Dumbledore or Gandalf. There's the archetype of the trickster, which we see in characters like Loki, or even the T-1000 from Terminator 2. All archetypes reside within the collective unconscious, and the whole universe contains variations of these archetypes. Now, because human beings are imperfect, giving adequate names and forms to these archetypes is very difficult. To try and give form to the archetypal mother, for instance, the ideal mother, is like trying to illustrate the internet. The internet is a collection of trillions of web pages. To try and put them all into one picture that is coherent to a human being is impossible. However, this hasn't stopped human beings from making attempts at trying to identify and illustrate the archetypes. To Jung, one of the main functions of religion was to try and identify these archetypal images and patterns. For example, in the case of Christianity, they identified the archetype of the ideal man in Jesus Christ. That's the primary example. But there were other attempts made by those who were mystically inclined. What many of you may not have realized until watching this video is that the images on tarot cards were attempts at identifying these archetypal images. Though Jung did not say much about tarot cards when he was alive, he made it clear that he viewed the images on tarot cards as attempts at depicting the archetypes. Not only that, he expressed a quasi-belief in what the tarot cards are supposed to do. That is, to use archetypal images to predict the future. Now, I'm not saying that Jung or I believe in the infallible accuracy of tarot cards to predict the future, because that's not the case. However, what Jung did say is that by understanding archetypes and how they shaped our past, we might use them to understand our future. To quote Jung directly, Tarot cards are psychological images, symbols with which one plays, as the unconscious seems to play with its contents. They combine in certain ways, and the different combinations correspond to the playful development of events in the history of mankind. If the intermingling of archetypes in the collective unconscious have directed the course of all life in the universe, then playing with those images in the present might divine the course of our future. In regards to Persona, the archetypes of the Tarot Arcana bind and penetrate all the heroes and villains. For instance, the Lover's Card depicts an archetype that influences the life of the main character on Takamaki, as well as several demons like the Pixie and Ishtar. As you play through the game, the characters and demons you interact with proceed in accordance with the card deck starting with the Fool card and ending, usually, with the World card. Just as with great journeys one takes in life, we are thrust into them as ignorant fools. Then, by interacting with the archetypes, or rather the variations thereof, we transform from a fool into the ultimate version of ourselves. This is why the final card, the World card, represents fulfillment, wholeness, and harmony. It is the final step. It is the reunification, spoiler alert, with the highest god, which we see happen at the end of Persona 5. Not only that, we see it happen at the end of Silent Hill 3. In respect to the tarot cards we see used in Silent Hill 3, there isn't much indicating their relevance to the characters or the events that take place. For that, we have to return to the holy grail of Silent Hill mythology, the Book of Lost Memories. In that book, we see one of the lead writers of Silent Hill, Hiroyuki Iwaku, speak about the tarot cards. According to him, 
The characters and events of Silent Hill 3 all correspond to the Tarot Arcana. Heather represents the Fool card, because she is the ignorant protagonist who is thrown into an unknown terrifying world. Faltiel represents the Magician card, for he is, in part, responsible for the shifts between the conscious real world and the unconscious other world. Claudia represents the High Priestess card. Douglas Cartland represents the Hanged Man card. Vincent represents the Moon card and so on. By interacting with these variations of the archetypes, Heather goes through a process of personal transformation, from that of a fool to a person who literally confronts God. I'd like to conclude with something that, I believe, definitively proves my interpretation of the tarot cards and the relevancy to Persona and Silent Hill. As I stated before, one of the archetypes of the collective unconscious is the ideal man, personified in figures like that of Jesus Christ. Jung had another name for this archetype. He called it the self. Jung believed that throughout our lives, human beings strive to achieve their own version of the self, to be their own ideal man. People use figures like Jesus for moral guidance so they may become synonymous with the Jungian self. As you can see, there is an equivalence between Jung's concept of the self and that of a god. The self is the god image that human beings wish to adopt, and we achieve the self by mingling with the archetypes that precede it. With this in mind, I cannot help but marvel at the fact that at the end of Heather's journey, she comes face to face with God. Not only that, the face of God is that of Alessa Gillespie, who was a previous incarnation of Heather. In other words, by confronting a god whose face is the same as hers, Heather is literally and metaphorically confronting herself. At this moment, we have to decide whether the creators of Silent Hill's story did this intentionally with Carl Jung's theories in mind. Moreover, we have to decide whether Persona took direct inspiration from Silent Hill. If they didn't, that can only mean one thing. The authors of both games were unconsciously motivated by archetypes. How about that? You guys didn't have to wait another year before I put out another episode of Silent Hill Mythology. I hope this lived up to the standards I set in my previous videos. If it did, please make sure to hit that like button. When you hit the like button, it tells the YouTube algorithm that not only this video, but all the other videos on my channel are worth watching. It will then share them around in people's recommended feeds. So please, hitting that like button provides a free and easy way to help me out. Also, if you want to help me continue to promote the academic value of video games and also uncover secrets that you won't find in any other game theory video or Reddit post, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Doing so will also help me continue this channel's secondary function, which is the promotion and discussion of proper mental health. I'll leave a link to my Patreon in the description box below. Until my next video, just remember, as per usual, to stay yellow.